Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Right Opinion, the home of a twat with too much free time and image. It's something that a fair few people seem to care about. And understandably so. In our communities, there's nothing wrong with a bit of reputation conservation, particularly if that aids your standing amongst others. Image can be reflected in our demeanor, our actions, our comments, and equally, it will be defined by how people interpret that behavior. When we encounter human beings and other alike entities, we spend a lot of time trying to paint a mental picture in our head for how we envision them. Now, we cannot look into their minds and read their every intention, but some judgment is always necessary because we have to make a decision decision which may involve bestowing responsibility or trust in certain people down the line, and that mental picture has to be factored in. However, this is typically reserved for personal relationships, and although we may hold greater opinions about certain issues, we won't typically assign a face to it. This is particularly the case with corporations. Now, it's completely valid to have distaste for corporations and their conduct, but it's also reasonable to accept that most companies are made up of a lot of interacting tiers, and this can lead to them being pretty much separated from the idea of consciousness altogether. Although I wouldn't actually agree with that and urge others to keep in mind that a decision will typically have a person behind it, it is often hard to conceptually feel any emotional connection to what a company may do. Hell, if we did that, we'd probably never stop being upset. And we do need to look out for our mental well-being too, you know. YouTube occupies a weird medium between the world of intimacy and distance, because although we may not feel a connection to a lot of creators on a personal level, their success partly relies on the direct support that we pledge towards them. A lot of celebrities feel a bit beyond our world, and YouTube creates communities that people can be involved in. However, because of that, there is a bit more direct accountability, and a judgment that does feel a little more personal. Therefore, we tend to apply certain standards for creators that we may not give to large, more multinational corporations, partly because of that connection and partly because we actually have the power to hold them accountable. Over the last few years, we've witnessed companies attempt to be, quote, woke and relate to the human condition, yet it never feels particularly real because although amusing, you receive the impression it's just another campaign focused towards a demographic of depressed teenagers who occupy the Twitter hellscape. On top of this, the tweets are never really channeled through the mind of an individual, and therefore we never put a face on the company or develop a personal connection. However, in 2015, a business managed to infiltrate a then budding YouTube community through a character who would become almost synonymous with the product that he was offering. Yes, long before the BetterHelp scandal would cause many creators to reevaluate how they keep an eye on sponsors they collaborate with, there was an even more bewildering controversy surrounding one of the most iconic YouTube sponsors, Samurai Buyer. Samurai, 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 Samurai. Buyer. Samurai Buyer is an online proxy buyer slash delivery service, which on first impressions wouldn't have the most applicable market potential in the YouTube environment, particularly in unboxing content, which was the main genre they were engaged in. However, this is where we introduce a man named Misaki, a now former representative and marketing manager of the brand in question. In communication, he seemed to be an oblivious Japanese gentleman attempting to sell merchandise to the Western world with your happiness at heart. Brought to stardom by his appearance on iDubbbz's Bad Unboxing series, he became renowned for his unassuming demeanor, broken English, and habit of appropriating phrases in a rather unflattering yet precious fashion. Do you have any specific Jap yellow merchandises that you want to get? How about clothes or foods? Can you hook me up? Hi homie, that would be great. And what is your size? Medium. Okay, homie. Over the next one and a half years, the Samurai Buyer brand would expand their scope in working with multiple YouTube personalities from across communities, capitalizing on this reputation, while Misaki obtained a unique status amongst creators and their audiences as a culturally sheltered yet conscientious and enthusiastic gentleman with the interests of his Western friends as his utmost priority. In many ways, he became the face of the brand, involved in a platform that treated him with the personal nature that he treated creators. It was so, so wholesome. <laughs> I fucking love Masaki. Oh god, man, this dude is incredible. But was it too wholesome? In the world where corporate and personal become one, the heavens will collide with the earth. And at the end of the spectacle, corporations and creators alike realized why they were probably better off in different worlds. Yes, today, my friends, it's a story of deception, exploitation, and intimidation with a side of legal fries. And with that level of dramatic potential, you'd expect there to be a comprehensive backlog of creators covering the situation. However, due to reasons that we'll discuss later, the landscape otherwise seems sparse. 
many of these videos having vanished from where they once were. Until recently, I was barely aware of this situation, and under the impression that Misaki had merely honorably faded into obscurity. It appears that I was wrong. Well, today, we're attempting to fill that gap with as much information as I could find, some spicy storytelling, and some hot takes for a cold case. It's been a while since we stepped in the YouTube time machine, and for people who weren't there, you may not even be aware of the troubled legacy of a man and a business that on principle appeared to encompass some of the purest qualities of YouTube culture. However, as a wise man once said, expectations are for losers. Does that mean there's a story to tell? Oh yes it does. So I suggest we get right to it. I guess the first specific question to answer is, what is Samurai Buyer? What sort of service do they offer? Well, it's a delivery service. However, the business doesn't hold stock themselves. What they tend to do is purchase content that can be typically purchased in Japanese domains, ship it to their warehouse, and then facilitate transportation of these goods which may otherwise be inhibited by international restrictions on those specific sites. Typically, this is related to online shopping. However, these services also extend to auctions, which sounds pretty fun if I'm to be honest. Because of their setup, you will probably be charged at two separate points for the service, once for the item's cost when you make the purchase, and then for the cost of the shipping once it has arrived at their warehouse with the weight and size measured. It's a curious system, but I suppose it's one that makes sense. Samurai Buyers About page doesn't really have much information about their origins. It much more focuses on their features and their benefits of using their services. This isn't a criticism, but given their lack of information elsewhere, how Samurai Buyer came into being may appear to be a bit of an enigma. However, it would not surprise you to know that its existence preceded its presence in YouTube communities. The first archives of the old site, SamuraiBuyer.jp, appeared towards the end of 2014. In fact, this old article announcing the launch of Samurai Buyer was published on the 14th of November 2014, which can give us a pretty strong grip on when it was established. It was launched by the Bushido Corporation headed by Yasuhiro Tanaka, who was already operating a similar service known as the Taobao Shinkansen, which helped deliver Chinese products to those in Japan. The Taobao being a reference to the popular Chinese shopping website and the Shinkansen being reference to the Japanese bullet train, symbolizing their speedy service, I assume. With the success of this venture, Bushido clearly sought to to reapply the formula on a larger scale, this time signaling intent to export Japanese items to China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States. In the first few months, this venture was well received, with another article being published in March of 2015, proudly proclaiming that over 110,000 users had visited their website before and after the new year. However, the article focused on success predominantly within China, and if we recall in the previous article, we would have noted that they seemed to have their sites set on the the United States. However, there were a few key problems that were likely hindering their progress in these markets. Now, we could talk about the lack of prestige or the already existent competition from within, but another significant problem was the language barrier. Samurai Buyer had a website. This website did have an English language option. However, it was not the most fluent. If you were browsing the web looking to purchase some foreign goods and encountered this website, which appears to possess the English skills of a spam email, it may not fill you with the most confidence in their ability to deliver. Here are some of the examples. The word of samurai is symbol of Japan that widely well known in the word. It is essential that using Japanese when you purchase at Japanese online shop and less shop support for English one. Our special staffs will assist you even though you cannot speak Japanese. These are my favorites. But jokes aside, this poor grip with the English language is something that pervaded their website and would probably make any Anglophone think twice about spending their hard-earned cash on such a convenience. So over the next few months, they worked on the linguistic flaws, eventually creating a more accessible and trustworthy site. However, it was still a bit clunky and unconvincing. Add this to other issues and it was probable that they weren't quite performing up to the level they were aspiring for. Now, at this time, there were a lot of creators on YouTube doing these unboxing videos, some of which were sponsored content. However, unlike a lot of businesses involved in this enterprise, Samurai Buyer weren't actually offering dedicated loot crates. Nonetheless, someone, maybe even Misaki himself, had the audacious yet relatively ingenious idea that they could be a part of this. And instead of using the boxes to promote a product, they could use it to promote their delivery service. Conceptually, it worked. In fact, it works incredibly well because whereas 
whereas with loot boxes you are constrained to showcase content that will be congruent with what you're offering commercially, with Samurai Buyer they could practically put anything in the box as long as it was something you could buy yourself on their website. This meant they could cater to the YouTuber's interests and compel more positive reviews and enthused endorsements. It's not exactly clear when they began contacting YouTubers with their propositions. However, iDubs wasn't actually the first person to work with them. I cannot say for certain who was, but what I do know is that on the 6th of September 2015, just under a fortnight before Samurai Buyer's first appearance on the iDubs channel, a creator by the name of the Anime Man uploaded a video called Where Do You Buy Awesome Japanese Goodies? Have you ever been in a situation where it's like, you look at stuff on Amazon or you look at stuff on eBay, some cool Japanese stuff, like whether it be snacks or t-shirts, posters, figurines, you know, awesome stuff that you can get in Japan, but it's like, ah, it doesn't ship to my country. Well, Samurai Buyer is a website where you can do just that. It's a proxy buying website. Pretty much you go onto the Samurai Buyer website, as you can see on the screen right now, and you pick out your goods that you want. And not to worry if it doesn't ship to your country because Samurai Buyer will actually go and buy the things for you and then with a small fee it will actually send you the stuff through Samurai Buyer rather than through Amazon and eBay. In this video, he answers the titular question, stating that you can in fact buy awesome Japanese goodies from this website known as Samurai Buyer. As a video, it doesn't really stand out from standard sponsored content, and there are no details regarding their interaction other than that he seems to be relatively familiar with them. On principle, it made sense for a company based in Japan to reach out to content creators who have audiences more engaged with Japanese culture and would have a greater desire to purchase their goods, thus finding greater utility within the website. The Anime Man's video was well received and obtained an adequate number of views. This may have satisfied Mizaki and the crew over at Samurai Buyer, who were probably unsure of what to exactly expect from their sponsored content. However, it's doubtful that they could have foreseen the fortunes that one of their next clients would bring them. Let's talk talk about that interesting character. 2015 iDubs, a bygone era for sure. In fact, that whole period feels like a blur, and I wouldn't blame anyone for not remembering that iDubs didn't actually have the most prosperous year. It definitely picked up at the end, but a lot of it was spent obtaining steady yet gradual growth. Nonetheless, he was carving out a firm niche with content that carried a general appeal while defining his brand as an independent creator. I'll put a link shield on my forehead. Hey, ladies. Do you like geek culture? Because I'm the biggest LOZ fan in the world. I speed run it and I go past, past the cuckoos. By September 2015, iDubs had two main series which were held in relatively high esteem by his audience. These were Kickstarter Crap and Bad Unboxing. The former is of little relevance. The latter is what caught the attention of Samurai Buyer. The Bad Unboxing series had been running since 2014 and consisted of our good friend Ian iDubs unboxing various items, testing them, often in unorthodox fashion, and then delivering his verdict. May the Triforce be with you. Oh my god. My brain is starting to hemorrhage a little bit. Some of his content was just Ian opening up what he felt like, but in the months approaching the Samurai Buyer Saga, he had increased focus on loot crates and methods of destroying their content. Nonetheless, these videos did receive a consistent number of views and retained a dedicated fan base. Now, iDub's channel wasn't exclusively Japanophilic, god. What an ugly word. But regardless, he had exhibited interest in Japanese culture and previously advertised products from the nation. Whether this factored into Samurai Buyer's decision to approach Mr. E. Dupes is another question, but they clearly saw an opportunity to win over some new buyers of the Samurai. To a sponsor, probably one of the most attractive features of iDubs' content is that he wasn't a creator defined by the topics he was covering. It was carried by his distinct persona, which meant that there was a level of security in the traffic that he would receive, even if it was the most unappealing topic like some sponsored uploads are. This is probably why a lot of sponsors worked with iDubs in spite of his relatively modest size at the time. He elevated the content by being able to apply his natural self and provide a promotion even if he wasn't always the most complimentary. iDubs, I can't believe you burned your subscriber plaque and also put guacamole on your Triforce Be With You t-shirt. I can't believe it. I'm gonna throw in the trash now. I'm not even gonna wash it. I could wash it easily. Take two f***ing seconds, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to throw in the trash. Want to know why? Because I don't give a f***. Now, although the English on the Samurai Buyer website was passable, what a handsome man, by the way. 
Their social media posts indicated that they may still lack the necessary proficiency to operate a particularly successful PR campaign. However, with intrepid, slightly misplaced confidence, they proceeded to connect with Ian and arrange their first collaboration, uploaded on the 16th of September 2015. Today we're going to be unboxing some P.O. Box packages. These three are sent to me, I think, by fans. I'm not exactly sure. The fourth one here was sent to me by a good friend that I met a couple weeks ago. His name is Misaki. In this video, Samurai Bai didn't occupy the whole review as the limelight was shared with some other fan mail. However, iDubs appeared to take an immediate liking to the products shared with him, some of which appealed to his more destructive, even masochistic tendencies. You sent me the good stuff, Misaki. I, I, oh. I don't, I don't, ha I know I don't have as many nerve endings on my foot, but, you know. Oh, Misaki, 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 please no hurt me. Please no hurt me, Misaki. I do not want this. Oh, <clears throat> oh, oh, shit, I almost bit my tongue off. Misaki, more like Mishaki. However, this was only half the appeal. The other half being the interaction with Misaki. My name is Misaki from Japan. I am watching your movie on YouTube and want you to introduce my Japanese products on your channel. Please let me know if you're interested. Now, in many environments, this sort of email would have been dismissed as spam, but IDubs chose to entertain it, firstly because he's an entertainer, and even if nothing had come of it, it would have made for an amusing story, and secondly, someone's offering to send you goods for free. The worst thing that can happen is that they don't send you the produce, or they send you something rather unpleasant, which IDubs may well have preferred, to be honest. In his book, it was a win-win. In the exchange that follows, Misaki appears to unknowingly win over the affection of iDubs and his viewers. Yes, I would love to make a video for your products. Send me the craziest stuff you have. Samurai swords, body pillows, whatever you want. Okay, I will. And may I know your real name and also phone number which require for shipment? So let's break down this defining conversation. A person who we assume to be Misaki reaches out in broken English, which although unprofessional on a website, can be rather endearing in conversation. In this instance, one can assume it's because of inexperience, but we tend to conflate this with stereotypes of innocence and naivety. It's also quite amusing. I used those delightful quotes earlier for comedic purposes, but combined with the other conditions, it can enable some pretty exquisite meme potential. However, the job was not done for Misaki. In rather typical iDubs fashion, Ian employs some offensive language in communicating with Misaki, particularly in addressing him. Have you got parcel yet? Not yet, I'll check it tomorrow, Nick. Now, Masaki could rebuff this or break off communication altogether, but he absorbs it and then uses it to further self-deprecate himself. In these positions, it brings a lot of personality to the conversation. It's this guy trying to hold a discussion on the level with iDubs, but not quite getting there. It's funny and it's cutesy. My bad, yellow man. I got the package today. I can't wait to open it. Equally, however, it establishes a firm bond between the sponsor and the client. You'll see the terms Misaki and Samurai by are often used interchangeably. Now, technically speaking, they are very different entities. Misaki is merely the representative of a much larger business. Because the job of sponsored videos is to focus on the product, Misaki's personality became an asset to the product itself. Misaki's personality put a face on the company, and that's not often done for many reasons, many of which will be revealed in due time. However, for the moment, Misaki was like that out-of-touch granddad trying to be cool. But in a way, the failure was just as captivating and this four-minute appearance outlined the start of a beautiful and fortuitous relationship, one that seemed to only blossom over the coming years. After the success of Samurai Buyer's first appearance on the iDubs channel, both parties seemed eager to work together again, and just over two weeks later, iDubs uploaded another bad unboxing, this time committing his undivided attention to the contents of Misaki's care package. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Bad Unboxing Samurai Buyer Edition. On the last episode of Samurai Buyer Unboxing, we took a look at a lot of products that Misaki sent us, and some products that Misaki didn't send us. From now on, anything sent by Misaki or Samurai Buyer as a whole, we're going to unbox on its own. We're also going to take a look at what Misaki's feedback was on the previous video. iDubs also discloses their dialogue following the initial upload, which appears to have devolved since their previous conversation. Now, it's point-blank offensive humor without too much depth to it. However, one thing that you could observe is the building of a rapport between iDubs and Misaki. Misaki appears to mold himself around the conversation. He reached out originally with a rather audio 
extraordinary email. The only detail one could observe was the linguistic deficit, and as Idubs applied his rather signature style of humor, Misaki seemed to adapt. By the end of their second email, our samurai representative appeared to be innovating with this humor, often once again to rather painful outcomes in my opinion, including referring to Japan as the Yellow Island. Now with jokes like this, which would be considered somewhat distasteful by many, you might receive the impression that he doesn't entirely know what he actually means, and his lack of awareness is what many would find amusing. But remember that Misaki was the person to refer to this in the first place, which means he's likely making some active effort to appeal to I dubs his humor, including making some statements which may arouse one's suspicion. Hell yeah, this is gonna be sick as hell. I'm going to crank that soldier boy all up and down that mofo. I don't get the meaning. Sorry, I English no good. If someone says I English no good, you may have reasonable cause to suspect that their English is better than they let on. Now, Misaki's English may not have been immaculate, but I do think he had a grip on the effect of such a comment. In fact, even Idos was mildly suspicious as to the identity behind this character. I don't know who Misaki is. I don't know if he's one of my subscribers and he's just pulling the biggest meme on me in the world but he's a fucking animal. However, it was another successful video, with iDubs reacting to the items with a degree of elation and, dare I say it, emotion. He says, I want to do a giveaway campaign for your subscribers because they're nice and I'm like kind of tearing up. I want to do a giveaway campaign for your subscribers because they're not. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Over the next few months, they would cultivate a strong working relationship with unique assortments of items, accompanied by a presentation which would raise a few eyebrows elsewhere, but not on the 2015 iDubs channel. No, they were right at home here. As I mentioned earlier, towards the end of 2015, iDubs began to experience substantial growth. And as I also mentioned, Ian's content often had appeal which was transcendent of the topics. The other facet that became incredibly beneficial for Ian was his strong production value and consistent brand. It gave his older content a lot of rewatch value for new audiences. And this led to cumulative views on previous uploads, which in turn yielded their promotion on the YouTube algorithm. At this point, Samurai Buyer had become a bit of a running meme on iDubs' channel. We we spoke about the image he garnered earlier, but it was like this hilarious naivety. Misaki demonstrated a very surface level grip on language and personality, which allowed iDubs to often control the conversation with a level of irony and exploit Misaki's inexperience in a rather underhanded fashion. Now this could be seen as quite mean spirited, but because iDubs didn't do it in a way which directly put Misaki down or even portray the language bar as this inherent disadvantage and more as grounds for comedic potential, people enjoyed it. Ian's happy, Misaki's happy, who would break up such a happy home? Well, although iDubs and Misaki had become their own power couple, Samurai Bai was still focused on acquiring publicity from across the YouTube spectrum. Their collaboration with iDubs was a blessing for sure, but it was a mixed blessing because although their appearance on Ian's channel would almost certainly increase their chances of landing future collaborations with similar creators, it also placed them in a rather awkward dilemma regarding their reputation. Now, normally, linguistic proficiency is something that you would want to be improved on upon experience and budget, something that a company like Samurai buyer would definitely have the resources to accomplish. But in this instance, Misaki's poor English became so associated with the brand that people harbored this expectation they would receive the same treatment, even if it was distinctly unprofessional. It was more entertaining and it set them apart from other businesses. It was this enshrined meme status and they were going to make the most of it. I knew that from Idub's video that he messed around with Misaki a little bit, but I think I took it to the next level and made him fall in love with me. I'll open the box in a second, Misaki. I want to show everyone the emails because they're funny. Throughout 2016, a large majority of Samurai Buyer videos were replicated in iDubs' format, with the content sometimes being delegated to an even more secondary position than the email interactions. In Jade Animation's video, she spends just under 10 minutes talking about their interaction before reviewing the products. It makes sense in her format, but it is a testament to how much of a force of personality Mr. Mizaki was considered to be, with him leaving a lasting positive impression on many of the creators he collaborated with. I can conclude that I love this man. He's the most innocent cinnamon roll of a Japanese man who just doesn't know English very well, and I can't express how much he has won my heart. This was the consensus. It was a sense of innocence that seemed to pervade his attitude, even if people did solicit humor from the interactions they shared with him. In many ways, his attempt to understand another culture beyond him appealed to people's innate senses of sympathy and warmth. How could you not help this modest Japanese man looking for a little promotion for his service? From 
from the big YouTuber senpai. All he wants to do is help all you weeaboos out there. When he was talking to me, he was like, oh, do you like anything specific? And I was like, no, you can just send me whatever you think I'd like. And then he's like, oh, you like Pokemon, right? And I was like, yeah, I like Pokemon. And he's like, do you like plush? And I was like, yeah, I like plush. And then he sent all the Pokemon and all the plush. <laughs> Masaki, you're so awesome. All these creators played along like it was some funny little in-joke. But in less than two years, Samurai Buyer had unleashed its market potential, not just in the United States, but all across the Western Hemisphere, bolstered by the image of its eccentric representative who had won over the hearts of his clients. However, when success hinges on one person's image, does failure not as well? Well, let's talk about it. Towards the end of 2016, Samurai Buyer maintained their vigorous promotional campaign, and you honestly wouldn't notice too much wrong. I did note one negative review on Reddit around September time, but otherwise you'd be hard pressed to find any controversy. However, Misaki himself did seem to be quite persistent at points. I just went on hiatus from Misaki for so long. He's really just been hitting me up over and over and over for months now. So here you guys go, Samurai Buyer is back, and Misaki Dearest is shipping. Literally. iDubs, who had not uploaded a Samurai Buy related video since March of 2016, then uploaded one in November, which seemed to be slightly more cynical in its tone. But Misaki's really been, really been getting at my fucking nerves this past year. You know, always chatting my ear off about dumb shit, wanting me to do things for him. And to prove that, I've stolen his gay logo, and I put it on a sweatshirt, and uh, any proceeds from selling these sweatshirts or shirts, will go directly to me and not Misaki. So fuck you, Misaki. This led some to question whether iDubs actually had any vitriol towards Misaki as the relationship was appearing to manifest into a more cruel affair. Now, although there were some comments which did appear to be quite cutting in their nature, alongside one that I do intend to return to later, if Ian was possessing any ill will, I doubt he would have given Samurai Buyer any attention at all, including promotion for a new vacancy, which is where our story takes us next. If you paid attention to that train wreck of a conversation, you may have noticed there was some talk about a Google form. That's just some shit Misaki wants me to promote for Samurai Buyer. I'll put it in the description. Click it or don't. Send your sperm to him. I don't care. In his Samurai Buyer video, alongside a rather cringe conversation where Misaki mistakes spam for sperm in such glorious hijinks, Misaki informs iDubs he is hiring for a position, a person who is interested in anime content and has competence in social media marketing. This was announced by iDubs and accompanied by an application form. However, because the iDubs fandom are predominantly ship posters and there had already been a hilarious sperm joke, most people just filled out the application under the denomination of sperm. Big funny. However, there was one successful applicant, and this person was an individual by the name of Merriweather. Merriweather is a creator slash producer who hails from Scandinavia. Nowadays, he's known for his work on anime girls, but back then he was a community freshman looking for a way into the industry. I prefaced that I bumped into the guy when working on another project, which didn't quite come to fruition, but my personal impression has always been positive and we are on good terms. Though I note it may influence my interpretation of the situation, I will do my best to present the differing perspectives. Merriweather was a fan of iDubs, but unlike the rest of the Google form respondents, decided to take it seriously, applying for the job being offered by the folks over at Samurai Buyer. His application was successful and he took up his job in this foreign land. In January, he tweeted out that he was working with Samurai Buyer on the social media front, covering their communications and social media. Now, unfortunately, last year, the original Samurai Buyer Twitter account was yeeted, so there's not too much that can be said regarding its interactions. But as we know, there appeared to be no apparent conflict or anything that would prime people's expectations for what was about to transpire. In fact, it seems that Merriweather ran the Twitter account very successfully and increased their follow account over tenfold. For a few months, all was serene, but come April there was drama afoot. Drama that would change the way people perceived Samurai Buyer and Misaki. It was April the 22nd, a fine day for a twit longer, and boy oh boy did we receive one. One delivered by the now former Samurai Buyer employee, Merriweather, in it detailing his rather unpleasant experience with the assumedly harmless Misaki and some very shocking revelations about the company and their marketing campaign. 
Mary said that he had moved out to Tokyo after quitting his job to pursue a position at Samurai Pie. Now, after a successful stint managing their Twitter and encouragement from Misaki to extend his stay, Mary decided to move from Tokyo to their offices at Fukuoka. However, all was not as imagined for Mary as the work environment didn't fulfill his expectations due to the rather unnerving atmosphere in part accountable to Misaki's cold and distant behavior, which played into his paranoia. In spite of this, Mary states he worked on numerous successful projects, including an actual loot box, About Time, and achieved the company target set for him far ahead of schedule. However, following the completion of these tasks, Mary decided to move back to Tokyo so to feel more comfortable, at which point Misaki revoked all of Mary's social media account permissions and access to company-related communications, citing self-promotion as the reason he was fired, something which Mary immediately disputed, showing the contradictory narrative by a Skype user we assume to be Misaki. Samurai Bai would regularly change the reasons why he was fired, giving some the impression it was more personal. Meriwether also shows DMs of this user behaving rather mockingly towards him, including changing his profile picture to all the Scandinavian flags bar Denmark, because Meriwether is from Denmark, and even threatening to call a lawyer at one point when another creator ceases their collaboration with him due to the dismissal, because, you know, people in this community care about others. However, it doesn't end there. Meriwether notes the lexicon and responds to those who might excuse it due to Misaki's inexperience with the language, stating that Misaki is in fact highly westernized, even having resided in Australia for years. What? Yes, we'll return to take a look at the verifiability of this story in due time, but Meriwether's account stated that Misaki's persona was actually the result of him instructing an African employee to spam YouTubers, only realizing the potential when IDOBS found amusement in the broken English. Once he has contact, he then proceeds to badger the creators for free promotions, so he can maintain his position at the company and take a paid vacation to America. Interesting detail, but whatever floats your boat, I guess. Mary stated that he believed that Misaki's decision was based on how Masaki no longer saw use for Mary at the company, and although understanding of that reasoning, still felt that Misaki's treatment of him was unjustified, given that Misaki was the person who encouraged Mary to extend his stay in Japan. It seemed irresponsible at best and downright malicious at worst, which is not what you really want to hear. Additional claims were also made in the twit longer about the service, including the assertion that they charge, quote, mystery fees for shipping, putting you in a position where you may end up paying extortionate delivery fees for modestly priced items. And although you can receive a refund for the shipping fee because you've purchased it, you can't obtain a refund for the item, which would then be placed into one of their mystery boxes. Basically, the allegation here is that Samurai Buyer Structure corners the consumer into paying much more than they may initially assume, which allowed Samurai Buyer to rip off their clients. There's also further testimony about the way that Ms. Saki behaved, the legality of the dismissal, and further adjuncts which served as supplementary responses to claims made by other parties involved. But the core message was clear. Ms. Saki was not who you, or nearly anybody, thought he was. And it didn't end there. This twit longer did reasonably well at the time. It received a fair few likes and retweets, and although it never really went viral, it caught the attention of relevant parties, such as iDubs, and fellow creators who may be considering a collaboration with Samurai Buyer in the future. Loads of negative reviews were posted about their products and people's experiences with the website. My favorite one being a rather disgruntled user who claimed that upon ordering a Samurai Buyer mystery box, received a decapitated toy gorilla. Now, I cannot possibly comment on the actuality of such an anecdote, but it should show where people stood in the moment. Misaki may not be the business, but he was the face. And when the face was smited, so was the business. I'd also add that there was a whole other drama that this spawned, which continued for the rest of the year that includes another rabbit hole going to much darker places where Misaki's involvement was vague. Maybe that'll be for another time. For now, we'll focus on where people's attention was regarding this situation. Some creators who had previously collaborated with Samurai Buyer also made their own statements of solidarity with Mary. There was an additional drama related to statements that Misaki had allegedly made on call regarding one of their first collaborators, the Anime Man, which is a statement that we'll return to later. In response to this, the Anime Man stated that he had ceased working with them due to the fact that he found elements of the operation fairly sketchy, not the most glamorous endorsement. Some even asked whether Mary had grounds to sue for unlawful dismissal, and whether the legal argument was in his favor, which I'm not sure sure it was given the fact that he wasn't full-time. Nonetheless, he was in a foreign country with little money and limited time. It was not practical, which is probably why they sacked him, because what was he gonna do? Well, uh, this. 
On top of this, other creators began to post videos onto YouTube. People began to spread the word, and suddenly it seemed like the whole world would know about the injustice of Samurai Buyer. However, as quickly as it was picking up, it was shut down. One evening, Meriwether appeared to tweet out legal threats which had been made by Misaki, and the next day this was followed by Meriwether first tweeting in a frenzied manner at iDubs begging for help, followed by a rather unconvincing tweet stating that everything he said was a lie. This was briefly followed by him pulling down all his tweets and statements and commenting that he didn't want to deal with any lawsuits and just wanted to leave it behind immediately. At around this point, Samurai Buyer had made a statement that they would be conducting further investigations before releasing another more official statement. This response then followed an alleged discussion yielding from a thread posted on Twitter. This tweet longer victoriously stated that Mary had now admitted to twisting the statements as well as an invasion of privacy against the corporation. However, for Meriwether's own sake, for his own privacy, like the magnanimous, genteel sir that he was, Misaki decided not to go into details regarding this because you can trust him. The, the thing is, when you don't give examples, then then people don't have anything to look at, which which pretty much implies that you're lying through your teeth. In the tweet longer, they mostly honed in on the claims that Samurai Buyer was a scam, a point which had now been adopted by some of the company's most staunchest critics and even some former fans. They reiterate that they do ask for payments, but that is inevitable as they cannot be certain of their own transportation fees due to the destination, the weight of the content, and the size of the items varying on a case-by-case -case basis. However, they pledge to make this detail clearer to avoid any confusion down the line and apologize for any concern that was raised. On top of this, they state that they're intending to extend their service promotion code Weeaboo, which will halve any service fee and epic detail to fulfill all your Weeaboo wishes. Hooray! They conclude by requesting people to continue supporting Samurai Buyer so that they can continue to improve their customer service, which I'm not sure is the best justification, but we'll let that slide for now, as there are more pressing matters at hand. Maybe Misaki was hoping that this response would go viral. Unfortunately, it did not. In fact, given the deletion of all the tweets, it seems people's investment in the situation dropped off very sharply. Maybe this was for the best, as the people who did read it didn't find it the most persuasive. Partly because releasing DMs where someone admits they're wrong wouldn't be a violation of their privacy, especially after you've sacked them. Misaki trying to use it to morally grandstand seemed transparent, and people cottoned on to the fact that these DMs may have been more telling about Misaki's behavior than anyone else's. On top of this, when he said someone's statements were, quote, twisted, well, it was unbelievably vague, and certainly not a clarification of what was true and what wasn't. Further to this, stating that someone invaded your privacy when all they did was accuse you of doing shady stuff and showing DMs of someone who is allegedly you being a prick just sounds like you're admitting to the shady stuff and are mad that someone called you out for it. It's basically attacking someone for being a whistleblower. Combine this with Masaki's legal threats that users had observed the night before, and to them it seemed that he had threatened a distressed person who was in a foreign country with little experience into a position of silence. Not a good look. On top of this, the twit longer just didn't really talk about much. Sure, the scamming point was pretty important, but equally, the assertion of treatment and that Masaki wasn't who he presented himself as was pretty relevant too. Now, no comment doesn't mean an admission of guilt, but it was going to be hard for creators to reinvest their trust in him or his brand. I assume some of these creators discussed it privately before placing disclaimers in their description, clarifying their position on the matter, and mostly, not complimentary ones. The gauntlet had been laid down, and although Meriwether's tweets may have been removed, a lot of people's content and narratives were still prevalent in this discourse, which didn't make the Samurai Buyer team very happy. A number of months later, I received some weird emails. Important legal action notice, Samurai Buyer. One of those creators talking about the matter was a young, then small YouTuber by the name of Slazo. Slazo had previously worked with Samurai Buyer himself, but upon finding out about the situation, had made the decision to terminate their relationship and upload a video calling them out for their shady business practices. Now, because of this new information coming out, I have privatized my video I made with Samurai Baya, which is annoying because I like that video, but I just can't stand by and endorse the actions of Misaki. Now, Samurai Baya is a company that doesn't care about its product. It only cares about the bottom line. They want to find the easiest way to make money, even if it means ripping people off. Well, now we know that money is number one priority over ethics, over customer service, over everything. And so it's very safe to say that the reason he fired Mary was because Mary had fulfilled his purpose. He had increased their social media's following by, by many times, a new mascot, a new subscription service, he'd made them a lot. 
He had laid out a clear plan for them that they could easily follow and he was no longer required. His video tended to mirror the claims made by Meriwether in the twit longer, making the video rather straightforward. However, as an upload on the situation, it garnered significant traction, obtaining over 400,000 views, thus becoming one of the predominant narratives for those wondering what happened. He also uploaded a follow-up video on the matter, which acquired a further 100,000 views. However, these are not videos that I want to focus on, no. In another video uploaded a few months after his original videos covering the situation, he details a serious legal threat made by the Samurai Buyer team, but one that appeared to be quite empty. Slazo, the videos that you have uploaded pertaining to speculation about our company has resulted in great damages for our image and business. While derived in part from fact, it is surrounded by falsehood and missing context, which has led viewers to believe we are therefore a bad company that should be avoided. As this video continues to be maintained and accessible to the public, the damages inflicted to us also continue to worsen and we can no longer ignore the issue. Consequently, we formally request that the two videos concerning Samurai Baya and the scandal occurring after a member of our staff was terminated to be removed within seven days of this mail received. If seven days passes without compliance or negotiation, we will be forced to consider legal action to arrange videos removed and damages. Um, that was two months ago. I responded asking what parts of the video in question they considered false, and they just responded with everything bad I said about them, just in quotes, and that's it. I responded asking how exactly my claims were wrong and what the evidence was, and they just respond a half month later, just asking me to take the video down. Um, and now let me clarify, if there was actually something I said that was wrong or misconstrued in that video, and they told me, just straight up told me why it was wrong, then I would do everything in my power to make sure people know that that was wrong. I would pin a comment on both of those videos, I would say it in this video, I would make it known, but instead they hit me with this legal action notice, this if you don't respond in a week we will take legal action for damages. No you're not, no you're not, and that is just the worst way to go about this. All it results in is a worse image for your business, something that you don't want and I don't want to deal with. However, the professional legal team over at Samurai Buyer persisted with the notices and these videos were eventually removed. As alongside other factors that we'll discuss soon, Slazo felt they had served their purpose. Another creator who uploaded a video on the situation alluded to a similar experience with Samurai Buyer as recently as 10 months ago, over two years after this conflict, on a video with 17,000 views. Now, a majority of what I've spoken about today has been removed since, some of which could be partly credited to Samurai Buyer's resolute approach towards those who have spoken about it, and the fact that no large creator was particularly outspoken, perhaps due to the fact that many of them had worked with Samurai Buyer themselves and felt rather embarrassed or awkward about it. Samurai Buyer has mostly succeeded in suppressing the situation, and with the sorts of sentiments conveyed in their emails, you'd think they'd have reason to. You would receive the impression that Samurai Buyer's business was mortally wounded by this coverage. But I can't say I completely agree. In fact, I think the damage was already done the moment that creators and audiences thought they were being deceived. If they were is another question. Let's talk about that. As I mentioned earlier, Misaki and Samurai Buyer had a close association, and an even closer one assumed by many audiences. Misaki's place in these sponsorships was as much a selling point as the products or the services themselves. Hello, awesome, I send you cool things. May I know your name and phone number? It needs for shipments. Then he asked if he could Skype me and I said it's 3 a.m. babe. I'm gonna have a kip if that's okay. In which he apologized profusely because he's a lovely, polite Japanese man. So when it was supposedly revealed that Misaki was not the man who people believed him to be, and was in fact the result of an accident which was exploited by a rather calculated individual who was not actually the representation of innocence, people probably felt rather deceived. Especially YouTubers, some of whom were probably a tad embarrassed bantering with this guy who was just so unassuming about your little English jokes and you exploiting the shortfalls for a little banter. Instead, the YouTuber was in fact the one being exploited. Because a lot of these creators probably wouldn't have made videos if they were approached by a smart, well-spoken businessman. 
Some people like Jaden Animations, who appeared to have such affection for Misaki, didn't know what to believe because of the person who she thought she had come to know. So what should we believe? Well, looking retrospectively at some of the conversations, it's hard to feel a slightly contrived nature in certain comments. In a way, this was expected because the way Misaki marketed himself tended to adapt to the person he was talking to. He'd be more offensive around the edgy commentators and more wholesome around the more family-friendly creators. But at the same time, this doesn't really alter comments such as I English no good or the confusing spam with sperm conversation. In hindsight, it seems glaringly obvious. But if you don't consider it, you probably wouldn't have noticed. I think although at the time, Idubs probably wasn't overly suspicious, he may well have been entertaining the possibility that he was being hoodwinked for the sake of clout. Masaki's really been, really been getting at my f***ing nerves this past year. You know, always chatting my ear off about dumb sh wanting me to do things for him. And it's like, dude, you know, I really like it that, you know, you're so non-PC, and I really I really appreciate that. You know, there's a lot of non-PC Asians out there, okay? You're not unique, Masaki. You don't have a stranglehold over me. It's this comment I found particularly interesting, because you received the impression that Samurai Bayer was drilling in this persona to the point where even iDubs was moderately irritated by it. And if you make iDubs pissed off at edgy humor, then you're probably doing something wrong. Ian went on to make this future comment about Samurai Bayer, which although hard to read into because it's Ian, seems to imply that he may have been quite happy that he finally had an excuse to end his relationship with Misaki and Samurai Bayer. It's hard to read into a lot of edgy creators and their opinions on the business, because it's often veiled in thick irony. But just over a month before the drama transpired, another creator and friend of iDubs by the name of Max Mofo made a video where he didn't seem particularly thrilled by the content sent to him either, nor the circumstances. I think we have a box from Masaki. Uh, I didn't actually want him to send me anything. He kind of sort of forced himself on me. And now I feel rude not to open it. I think he's the only person in the industry where you can, you have to open his shit for free. Uh, most YouTubers, I feel, to do sponsored videos or anything by a product, usually there's a little bit of, you know, back and forth involved. But iDubs pretty much made Masaki famous. And now he thinks he can f***ing parade his shit everywhere and everyone will just open it for him. And he sent me jack shit. I don't think he thinks much of me. Oh, uh, there's not much to work with here. I think the joke may have been wearing thin, and perhaps people would have found out by their own accord eventually. But it was a tad too premature for people's liking, which led to the rather abrupt response. On top of this, although I note at the start that their social media presence as English wasn't very good throughout most of 2015, I'd also note that it had significantly improved in the run-up to the iDubs collaboration, with only occasional English mistakes, and certainly not ones that were exhibited in future conversations. I think there were definitely elements of Misaki's personality that were played up for theatrical effect. But was the extent of the deceit really as far as implied? Was Misaki a fluent English speaker who had spent time in Australia? Well, let's reintroduce the anime man. The anime man was the guy who worked with Samurai Buyer before iDubs. He was also an Australian living in Japan, and his subsequent withdrawal from doing business with Samurai Buyer would certainly make an observant individual take a second glance. But hell, maybe he was just jealous of the fact that other creators didn't have to pay for their promotion as Misaki claims. Wait, Misaki claimed that? He's a pretty nice guy, but uh, you know, he never would find me these days. I don't know. Oh. Maybe some jealousy. In a clip briefly leaked at the height of the drama, an individual who appears to be Misaki seems to be talking about the anime man in quite effortless fashion, perhaps with the slightest tinge of an Australian accent. Uh, Joey, you mean? Joey, yeah. You know him? No, I don't. I've just seen you've worked uh, with him. Yeah, um, he's actually staying, he was staying in Australia. Oh yeah, I heard he moved to Japan. Yes, uh, he's uh, half Australian and Japanese. Now, in all fairness to Mizaki, he doesn't really say anything particularly inflammatory. He seems to be theorizing in quite a free-form manner. But equally, that free-form manner doesn't really match the forced English mistakes in conversations that were often portrayed in people's uploads. 
Is this the only possible explanation? No, but it's not something that's ever been dispelled. There was a brief comment from Misaki on Twitter during the situation claiming that he needed staff to help translate a response to someone, who's I'm not sure, but it was attempting to maintain that character, but people were not convinced. I think that the whole ordeal just ruined the image of Misaki so much that people didn't really know who he even was. Even if he couldn't speak perfect English, his whole demeanor was still pulled into question. His conduct was a far cry from what had been expected of him, because he was seen as this community figure, and because he was seen as this community figure, he was going to be held to community standards, especially given that his stick was this innocent, wholesome man. Very few YouTubers who had previously worked with Masaki, given him their time, and entertained their quirky conversations were likely going to be interested in rekindling that relationship, because it undermined the person who they had come to know. It also ended the potential for future relationships on this basis because it undermined the punchlines. Jokes like these, as unamusing as they were to me, were based on the sincere naivety of Misaki's character. If you have an interaction with knowledge that it's all just an act, it doesn't make the misunderstandings funny because it doesn't take a comedy genius to change spam to sperm. It's only really funny when the person isn't aware. With this in mind, Samurai Bio were basically relegated to another company with no real outstanding qualities. But it wasn't even that. Because of the persisting stigma left by the controversy, they can't really bring back the character and any other promotional campaign conducted on YouTube to people who were familiar would seem out of character. Their relationships with YouTubers was mostly at an end. I have to admit, however, I don't really feel overly bad for any YouTubers who merely collaborate with Samurai Buyer under the pretense that they were talking with this friendly Japanese man, because it was a pretty naive assumption to make on their behalf in the first place. Such an innocent image is something that would have been hard to maintain naturally for over a year, because surely at some point it's gonna clock that they should improve their linguistic skills, and the experience of talking to other people with English as their first language would have helped them improve anyway. This persona would have been pretty difficult to maintain naturally, given its fame. The perception people always had when they imagined Misaki was almost like this one-man show at Samurai Buyer because it's the only real way that such a business would have been able to work. Misaki's whole existence became inherently counterintuitive and people entertained it because it was fun. I think creators just saw it through a very narrow, optimistic lens based on stereotypes they had formulated in their head, and they probably jumped to the comedic potential rather than considering the likelihood of this persona. Do I blame them for that? No. I could see myself easily doing the same thing, but I don't think it's some huge deception on that front. It's just a bit of a letdown. But that letdown ultimately harmed Samurai Buyer more than any YouTuber. So is it not them we should feel sorry for? Well, not really. In the SpongeBob SquarePants movie, there's a scene where our protagonist tried to purchase ice cream from a sweet old vendor lady. Yet something isn't quite right. This scene may not intend to be, but it's a good representation of how one's focus on the ideal can sometimes distract us from the reality. Credit where credit's due, Samurai Buyer employed a bold marketing strategy which paid its dues for a substantial amount of time. But ultimately, when said marketing strategy is based on a level of deception, you always risk a loss of trust when it is revealed, even if it is something that perhaps people should have worked out anyway. In a way, if Samurai Buyer had revealed it themselves, we may have all been able to have a laugh about it and move on. But the circumstances under which this information was released couldn't be more ironic if it tried to be. Misaki and perhaps some of the members at Samurai Buyer maintained a character that was given support and attention due to his perceived innocence and blind kindness. It relied on people's sympathy and acceptance, even if it was from a somewhat condescending position on the YouTuber's behalf. With that in mind, when they encountered someone in a similar position, they should have at least understood the fundamental conditions that drive us to do the right things in those situations with those people, because they were taking advantage of those exact sentiments from YouTubers. And yet when their new employee, who was in a country that he didn't know, with a language that he didn't speak, perhaps slightly naively, when they should have shown a bit of sympathy, they neglected that mantra. It's hard to know exactly what occurred, but to me it seems that after leading someone on, they sat him for reasons they've continuously changed and then proceeded to taunt him while he was in distress. Just the thought of that couldn't be more antithetical to the persona that Misaki had constructed. This doesn't mean that the narratives were perfect, I think the twit longer was flawed, 
it was overdramatic and it appears that Mary was heading out to Japan regardless, though I assume the extension wasn't planned. Nonetheless, it seems somewhat misframed in the twit longer and he was criticised for it. However, he also ended up being subject to some pretty rotten narratives which were completely unsubstantiated, including claims that he had acted out in the office, which were attracted when the guy making them admitted he had barely worked at the company. There's a good Reddit interaction that occurred where you can see these two arguments. Unfortunately, even if you saw the flaws in the claimant's statement, it didn't alter the experiences they appeared to be rooted in. And the fact that Samurai Buyer had altered their explanation multiple times made it look like they were struggling to justify an ill-founded dismissal and subsequent vicious, malicious derision. Once the news broke and they finally realized this was impacting their reputation, they changed their tune, but not by bringing back the old friendly face of Misaki. No, that was already in the past. They went into full corporate mode, threatening legal action against Merriweather and anyone who spoke ill of them. They persisted this campaign against creators who uploaded videos on the matter, even uploads which didn't receive the most traffic, ones that were basically bare bones reaction videos. I honestly think that most of these threats didn't carry much weight, but it also seems a fair few creators were aware that their narratives were slightly misguided, particularly the one regarding the fraudulent nature of their site. As I said right at the start, how they format payments is a tad novel and I can see how it could have been misleading. However, I do not think their site is structured to intentionally scam people, although certain stories such as the leftover returns being placed in loot boxes may well be true. When you're accusing a company of scamming, I can see how that would place you on shaky ground if you didn't have the evidence to back up those claims. So I also think that self-doubt on the behalf of creators probably played into the outcome of this being mostly removed from the internet. And to be fair, that's a reasonable justification. It does seem that some narratives with less substantiation were caught amongst the stronger ones. Nonetheless, given their legal team were about as competent as the Mr. Misaki sales persona, it just looked like a desperate attempt to eradicate the existence of the incident. So I'll take a moment to set the record straight. I don't think Samurai Buyer is a scam website. I don't think they're going to run off with your money into the sunset and you will not receive your product. If you want to order from them, go for it. This obviously does not invalidate any legitimate complaints that people have, and there were issues with how they presented certain information. However, I think this problem has been most Mostly resolved and they currently offer ways to approximate shipping fees on the basis of predictive package specifications. On top of this, much of their behavior could be chalked up to basic corporation standards. I'm sure that it's not unheard of for a company to lay off a foreign employee who they feel like they've used up and can probably get away with dismissing. And I'm sure that YouTubers have collaborated with corporations who've done far worse things than Samurai Buyer. I want to make that clear. However, they can get away with it because they don't attach a personality to their brand, nor do they ingratiate themselves into the community as this benevolent friend to all. When Samurai Bai did that with Misaki, they lost the privilege of distance, especially for Misaki himself, whose childish antics in the situation were that which not even a corporation would typically stoop to due to the sheer insensitivity and terrible optics. This was what jeopardized relationships, especially that with iDubs, one of their biggest cheerleaders, who Samurai Bai literally used to promote this job opening. I wouldn't be surprised if Ian genuinely felt bad for promoting it in the first place, and hell, there was certainly no way that he was ever working with them again. It was awkward for anyone who had promoted the narrative about this sweet, naive Japanese man after the situation, now that someone from the community was actually screwed over. But as said, I didn't blame them, it was easy to miss. The stupid thing is, if Samurai Buyer hadn't intimidated Meriwether and others, they probably could have found a middle ground resolution which the public recognized and both sides endorsed, where some of the inaccuracies were rolled back on. Instead, by threatening legal action and causing an immediate removal from someone who seemed frenzied and panicked to online onlookers, no one actually believed the retraction was sincere and it just made them look like corporate bullies. People aren't idiots and they are sensitive to these circumstances. Samurai Buyer wasn't, and that was what under mind any humanity people thought they had. Since the situation, Samurai Buyer have maintained their narrative, and although I can understand their annoyance at certain claims, I still feel like they're missing perspective. Many of their tweets from their old account have fallen into the suspension of bits. However, they still receive questions about the situation on their new one from time to time, and they have continued to attack Mary, including calling him bitter, butthurt, and even racist, which is pretty ludicrous given the standards set by Misaki. Hell yeah, your wife?
I am yellow Nick swag. Why do you always say swag? He recently tried to contact me a lot saying how he wants to do a couple of voice calls with me. Unfortunately, I never responded and I, I'm actually too much of a pussy to talk in voice chat with Misaki. This isn't to say that I necessarily think this is the most egregious content, though the blackface is pretty unpalatable, but they set the standard for edgy humor in your marketing. And unless someone was actively tweeting out hate content, for which they probably would have been immediately reprimanded for, then I don't believe that such a claim is remotely fair. You'd think that after after seeming so upset about being called scammers, they'd understand not to throw out such flagrant terminology. But oh well, an eye for an eye, I guess. Misaki has since supposedly left the company and moved on to greener pastures, so any comments are unlikely to be coming from Misaki himself now. But if they're going to maintain that point of view, I don't think they should do that without a bit of challenge. However, that's far from the main intent behind this video, which is more a cautionary one. The Misaki character had limited gimmicks, and yet he basically found a cheat code to bypass a lot of complex judgments we would typically make when considering collaborations, even if it was accidental. It allowed him to basically be a social comedian, moving between YouTuber conversations and adapting to their style, sometimes to uncomfortable degrees. If anyone else had done this, it would have seemed quite disingenuous, and yet people gave it a pass because we assumed it was some sweet foreign man trying to fit in with our little YouTube project. Samurai Buyer then often sent over items that cater to the individual creator, whether that was Pokemon plushies for Jaden or stuffed female legs for Filthy Frank. It made them think that Mr. Mizaki, in all of his naivety, still cared about their interests. How sweet. But they were just part of the plan. Eventually, that more cutthroat corporate side showed and everyone was shocked. But like the SpongeBob SquarePants scene, sometimes you gotta look out for the bigger fish. The message I'll conclude on is that it's worth being careful about the assumptions you make based on a person's lack of technical skills. It doesn't necessarily reflect their character, especially if the person's an adult with decent social ability elsewhere. Your sympathy can easily be exploited and eventually you or someone else finds out the hard way. The moment you think someone can do no wrong is the moment you probably underestimate them. That's not to be paranoid, just cautious. Samurai Buyer was the business that got to have a human face for a bit, and as a fun little novelty, I suppose it can tell us a little, and makes for at least an interesting tale. But as a trend, in a world where we already have more than enough brands trying to infiltrate the human mind, I think I like this Pinocchio better off hollow. So yes, that was the video. I hope you enjoyed. I am an absolute mess right now, and I'm probably going to go take a shower, have a rest, because that was a bit more taxing than I expected it to be. Quite a dense video with a lot of words and sentences. I want to give a big thanks to my editors. Once again, I'm sure they have done a fantastic job. Please go and check them out. I will leave them in the pinned comments. I also want to give a big shout out to my Patreons. Once again, $10 Patreons being shown on the screen right now. And I also want to give a big thanks to my $50 Patreons, Hypercube, Sumhullabaloo, Amanda, and Caroline, as well as my $100 Patreons, Yesenia Ramirez, Brandon Junk, and Christopher Carras. Thank you again for your support. It means the world, and it keeps my head up in these times, in these crazy times, so much appreciated. I don't have too much else to add. If you want to find me, uh, my social medias will be in the pinned comment too, though I have been on a bit of a break from them. But, you know, if you want to try, there they are. And I don't know what else to say, just... Thanks again for all your support, guys. Take care. I'll see you in the next one.